call to worship today comes from Psalm 91. So I invite you to um, read with me this psalm and use the responses. Your response is in the white print. Those who dwell in the shelter of the Most High, they shall say to the Lord, You are my refuge and my support, my God, and He shall deliver you from the snare of the hunter. He shall cover you with his pinions, and you shall find refuge under his wings. His you shall not be afraid of any terror by night, of the plague that stalks in the darkness. They shall call upon me, and I will answer them. With long life will I satisfy them. What a wonderful God we have with those promises. I invite you to stand with me as we sing our hymn of praise. Um, let's stand as you're able. Praise to the Lord the Almighty. We come before God with our prayers of adoration and praise. Let's pray. God, source of our trust and peace, we come to worship, praise, and adore you. We thank you for Jesus, his life and light penetrate the dark and fearful places of the world in ways that bring the words of the psalmist that we just read, bring those words to life for us. For in Jesus, our fears are diminished through the power of the Holy Spirit present with us. Come, Lord, and invade our hearts in this time of worship. Invade us with your amazing grace and transform our lives with your overwhelming offer of mercy. We thank you that through the power of your Holy Spirit, even we can become channels of your love to a lost and broken world. We pray that this time of worship and the service of our lives may be a worthy expression of our praise and thanksgiving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For our prayer of confession today, I'm using a prayer from Evelyn Underhill. I invite you to join me with this prayer that she's provided. Let's pray. God, penetrate those murky corners where we hide memories and tendencies on which we do not care to look but which we will not yield freely to you, that you might purify and transmute them. That persistent buried grudge, the half-acknowledged enmity which is still smouldering, the bitterness of that loss we have not turned into sacrifice, the private comfort we cling to, the secret fear of failure which saps our initiative and is really inverted pride, the pessimism, which is an insult to your joy. Lord, we confess these things and bring all these to you. And we review them with shame and penitence in your steadfast light. Forgive us, we pray, through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Hear these words of forgiveness. The psalmist assures us that we are loved, protected and saved by God. And we know this to be true because we believe that Jesus was sent by God into the world not to condemn this world, but that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned. Thanks be to Thanks God. Be to God. Now we're going to hear the scripture reading, I think. Um, Lorna? Lorna has a reading for us from 1 Timothy. Thank you. Today's reading is from Timothy, chapter 6, uh, 1 Timothy, that is, chapter 6, verses 6 to 19. Of course, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world, 
so that we can take nothing out of it. <clears throat> but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. <coughs> Pardon me. But as for you, man of God, shun all this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep the commandments without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the right time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. It is he alone who has immortality <clears throat> and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honour and eternal dominion. Amen. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches but rather on God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of a life that really is life. Many of us bring our offering um, by direct debit, um, but if you have offering to bring today, now's the time to bring your offering forward as we contribute to the work of God in this place and in the wider church and the world. Let's pray. God of grace and glory, you have enriched our lives with so many gifts. The greatest, of course, being your amazing love and grace to us. Jesus calls us to enrich the lives of others with a love expressed in practical and caring ways. And so we come and bring this offering, this, the funds we've given by direct debit, the money we bring on this day. And we also bring the service of our lives as evidence of your love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Gospel reading comes from Luke chapter 16, and Lord is going to bring that to us. The Gospel reading today is from Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 31. There was a rich man who dressed in purple and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In, in Hades, where he was tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, 
Neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Well, this is an interesting passage, isn't it? Do you find that interesting? Interesting to try and preach on, I can tell you. But this is a parable that Jesus told, and it's a wake-up call. If this is an unnerving story for you, then it has the effect that Jesus intended. This is a story about perspective on life and keeping our perspective, our attitudes in line with God's plan for the world. Jesus tells the parable about a rich man and Lazarus, and it's a story that should discomfort us as it has every generation since Jesus told it. It's a warning about the dire danger of wealth to the human personality. It seems that Jesus is of the opinion that where money and possessions are God, people do not matter. The affluent very quickly become desensitized to the suffering of others. Jesus talks about issues relating to money repeatedly in the Gospel of Luke. The evangelical social activist Jim Wallace points out that there are 908 verses in the Bible that talk about how to handle our wealth. I haven't checked that out or counted them, but that's what he says. In the previous verses before our reading today, in Luke 16, chapter 13, Jesus says, you cannot serve God and wealth. And that's a link to the reading this week. Because the next verse tells us, the Pharisees who were lovers of money heard all this and they ridiculed him. So he said to them, and this is where he told the parable. Now remember, a parable is a made up story, a story that Jesus made up. And I'm guessing he's better at making stories up than I am, or even you might be. But Jesus makes up a story to imprint a truth upon us. And Jesus tells this parable. It's a parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And Jesus is trying to get under our defences and confront us with the damnable disregard we have for the less fortunate. In it, he uses some of the common imagery of paradise and Hades, which was current at that time. He takes well-known imagery and uses it to paint a frightening picture of the significance of our disregard for the needy. Jesus is saying one day you'll have to face up to the truth about yourself. And a favourite way of making this point in the ancient world was to imagine what happened to people when they died. Then their true reward would come. So we read in the scripture, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to the embrace of Abraham. Then the rich man died and was buried. From the torment of Hades, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have some pity and send Lazarus to dip his finger in water and cool my tongue. You will notice there's no record of this rich man doing anything to harm the sore covered beggar, the beggar that was sitting at his front gate. He did nothing to harm him. He didn't lay a finger on him or order him to be moved on even. The rich man doesn't hurt the beggar in any way. And the rich man is not portrayed as an overt evildoer. His crime is his self-preoccupation with which that prevented him from caring about others as he cared for himself. The rich man just ignores him. The rich man acquiesced in the social structures through which he was maintained as a wealthy man, and others were kept in place in the socio-economic scale he was content with things as they were. He was rich, this guy was poor, and that worked for him, it suited him. In his earthly life, just as a gate separated them, because it was the gate 
through which the rich man passed every day, day by day. And day by day, he ignored him. Day by day, he failed or refused to see him. And day by day, centimetre by centimetre, his comfortable lifestyle had been digging a trench between himself and the have-nots of this world. A trench that widened and deepened into a great gulf. A chasm in the eternal moral order of things. A gaping expanse which nothing was likely to cross in life or in death. Think about that gulf. Because Jesus in this story, in this parable, is wanting us to think hard about it. Verse 26 says, Between us and you is a great gulf. We cannot pass over to your side, and your side cannot cross over to us. Jesus is using a picture of the future to address the present. Jesus is saying, This is a damnable way to live. It's damnable now, not just in the future. And it is self damnation. And we dig the gulf ourselves. We don't need any judge to damn us. We damn ourselves by our attitudes and our choices. We damn ourselves by the things we do not do, just as much by the things we do do. And the parable is about that, how we injure ourselves. There is a gulf between Hades and Paradise, and we can't ignore the gulf that exists in our world today between the hungry and the well-fed. The United Nations Global Hunger Report, released in July, just July this year, states that the number of people affected by hunger globally rose to as many as 828 million. I can't imagine that number of people, can you? It rose to 828 million in 2021 which was an increase of 46 million since 2020 and 150 million increase since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. This United Nations report provides fresh evidence that the world is moving further away from its goal of ending hunger, of ending food insecurity and malnutrition in all its forms by 2030. That was the goal. We're getting further away from it. And it is this gulf, this obvious injustice in our world that breeds contempt. History has shown us that terrorism is not cultivated in affluence, but in injustice. This is an unhealthy, dangerous gulf. Old attitudes and prejudices don't disappear easily. And when the rich man in Hades wants someone to warn his five brothers, he looks for a messenger. The rich man asks Abraham, send Lazarus back from the dead to warn them. Did you get that touch? Even in hell, the rich man sees the poor as the servant of the rich. Send Lazarus. Even from paradise, they're expected to be at the beck and call of the rich. Send that beggar Lazarus from the dead to warn my brothers. I'm guessing he didn't have any sisters that should go. But see how blind this rich man is to his attitude. No way, says Abraham. They already have the teaching of Moses and the prophets. That should be enough. The rich man's not accustomed to being refused. And he says... But if a person should come back from the dead, they'll repent. He argues the point. Don't fool yourself, says Abraham. Even if someone came back from the dead, they still would not repent. Resurrection will not change the attitude of those who are self-satisfied. The affluent are in a comfort zone where calls to repent seem rather peripheral and irrelevant. I guess the question is, as we read this scripture today, where does this parable find us? Where indeed? It would be difficult for us to see ourselves as the crippled, starving, sore-infested Lazarus. 
and maybe we find it difficult to see ourselves as the affluent rich man. Even though compared with 80% of the people in the world, we're among the extremely wealthy. Perhaps in this futuristic parable that Jesus tells, we should find ourselves among those five brothers, the ones who are still alive, who need to hear the warning. And Jesus is speaking to the living about how to live life. I'm encouraged that in this congregation, we understand about seeing the needy and we respond to that. And there's so many of us either support or do the action of ministering to those that are in need in so many different ways. In that we can be affirmed that we're hearing God's word and we're responding to what God requires of us about how to live our lives. That's what Jesus is talking about. And maybe we are those who still have the opportunity to be instructed by the scripture and see the beggar at our gates. It's like a back to the future type of parable where Jesus offers us a glimpse into the outcome that we can do something about if we only act now. The rich man says, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And isn't it true? Jesus, the one who rises from the dead, comes to us with this parable about how to live a life. Thank God we're listening to him and we're responding. Calls us to repent of things that might creep into our lives and have us act another way. To change our lives and to look, go in a new direction. The events of the last few years have certainly given many people a new perspective, new priorities for their life and how they'll live it. Events like the floods that have devastated so much of our country, the fires before that, that left people homeless and running for their lives, and then a pandemic that seemed to affect all of us and have us assess what we needed to do. These events challenge us to think about what's important in our lives and how we're going to live. It was this parable of the rich man and Lazarus that persuaded Albert Schweitzer to leave his comfortable life in Europe to found the Lamborghini Hospital in Africa. In this parable, Jesus shows us a new way to live, the way of God's kingdom, a way of justice for all. May we have the courage to allow God to continue to open our eyes to the needy at our gate. The good news of this gospel is that because of Jesus, who has risen from the dead, it is possible for us to have the grace and the strength and the wherewithal to respond. May God continue to guide us and empower us for that task. Amen. Our next hymn is a hymn that affirms that as we sing beauty for brokenness, I invite you to stand as you're able and we'll sing together. Please be seated and we bring our prayers for others and ourselves. Let's pray together. Lord, as we've been reminded, there are those in the world who will go hungry today and tomorrow and face an uncertain future. We pray for our sisters and brothers in countries that are enduring war, floods and famine. We pray for their leaders that they will have the wisdom to make the changes that are necessary. We pray for all those in need and ask that we will find the ways that we can be part of the answer. We pray for those who are in despair at this time, for those who carry the pain of broken dreams, and for those whose lives are coloured by memories of sadness and loss. Bring comfort, we pray, that they may find their hope 
in your love. And for ourselves we pray, O Lord. Save us, O Lord, from the sadness, from the tragic and self-destroying sickness of being so imprisoned by self-pity or trapped by the need for security, from being so seduced by possessions, subservient to money, or captive to the myth that to have leads to happiness, that we lose the passion for living and loving, the courage for daring and hoping, that we lose the freedom for growing and changing, the capacity for giving and receiving, the humility for learning, the tenderness for understanding, the strength for enduring, the trust for believing. Save us from forfeiting forever the joy of your kingdom, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us in the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We sing again the hymn, Praise with Joy, the World's Creator. Vine to stand. inspired, sustained and empowered by the Holy Spirit and in the name of Christ we go in peace. Amen. Let's sing together that blessing song, Let There Be Love shared among us and I invite you as we sing this that you turn and look at the community of faith here so we can share our love together that we're able to spread to the community in which we live. Let's sing our blessing song. 